Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. While the Civil War ended slavery, the education system for African Americans was still close to non-existent during the Reconstruction and Jim Crow era that followed. But in the early 1900s, famed educator and founder of the Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington, and businessman Julius Rosenwald embarked on a venture to help change that. They began building the Rosenwald Schools, placed where young African Americans were able to begin their educational journey in hopes that they can live better lives. The schools were a success, totaling nearly 5,000 across the South. Tennessee was home to more than 300 of these schools. Right now, at the Tennessee State Museum titled A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 schools that changed America. It features the photography of my first guest, who also curated the exhibit, Andrew Feiler. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to This is Nashville. Great to be with you. Really a pleasure. So, no, Andrew, tell me, how did you... How, how, tell me how you first learned about the Rosenwald Schools. So I had never heard of Rosenwald Schools until February of 2015 when I found myself at lunch with a woman named Jeannie Syriac, who had originated the role of African-American cultural heritage specialist at the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office. And the story shocked me. I am a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have been a civic activist my entire life. The pillars of this story are are the pillars of my life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? So I came home and I Googled it and I found that there were a number of history books on the topic, but there was not a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And so I set out to do exactly that. And over the ensuing three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 of the program states and shot almost a quarter of the surviving schools. Uh, uh, And the result is this book and this exquisite exhibition at the Tennessee State Museum. Well, let's talk about the two men who set up the schools. First, there is businessman Julius Rosenwald. Can you tell tell us more about him? Yeah, so Julius Rosenwald is born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany. He grows up in Springfield, Illinois, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. And he rises to become the president of Sears, Roebuck and Company. And with innovations like satisfaction guaranteed or your money back, he helps turn Sears into the world's largest retailer of its era. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history. And his cause is what only later becomes known as civil rights. Booker T. Washington, born into slavery in Virginia, uh, goes to Hampton College, becomes an educator, and as you mentioned, is the founding principal of the historically black college in Tuskegee, Alabama, originally known as Tuskegee Institute. These two men meet for the first time in 1911, just over 110 years ago. And in 1911, you have to remember, that is before the Great Migration. So 90% of African Americans live in the South, and public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks with a fraction of the funding provided for the education of white children. Many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African Americans. And in 1912, these two men create the program that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. Now, tell me, I mean, I'm thinking about this. We Here we have a man who was born into slavery and found a way to get an education. Then we have mm-hmm. a man who is a first-generation Jewish American, and they are working together to provide education for young black Southerners. Tell us a little bit more about their relationship. What was that like? So Ju- Julius Rosenwald uh, is motivated by his Judaism. He sees America as a safe haven from anti-Semitism, and he sees that safe haven weakened by how America treats her African-American citizens. And he says, I believe in America, but I do not see how America can go forward if part of her people are left behind. Booker T. Washington had founded Tuskegee Institute. He is aware of Julius Rosenwald's um, 
emergent philanthropy. And he goes to Chicago to meet Julius Rosenwald. And he invites Julius Rosenwald to become a board member of Tuskegee Institute. And Julius Rosenwald takes a train later, later that year, 1911, down to Tuskegee. He's extremely impressed with what he sees. And he agrees to serve on the board. But the two men like each other, and they develop this very close personal friendship. And they keep talking. What else can we do together? And it, it's in 1912 that they hit on this idea that becomes the Rosenwald Schools program. So they not only have a close um, uh, civic alliance, they have a deep personal friendship. Now, my next guests know the impact made by the Rosenwald Schools firsthand. Brothers Frank and Charles Brinkley attended a Rosenwald School in Cairo, Tennessee. Such a pleasure to have you both. I want to thank you both for being here, and welcome to This is Nashville, gentlemen. Thanks for inviting thank us. Thank you. Really Our great. pleasure. Yeah, it's really, pleasure's all mine. Now, Frank, I understand you know your family is high on education, and your father was the principal of the school you attended, right? That's right. Uh, what did he t tell us more? It was a one-room school where he was a teacher, principal, cook, and the whole thing. Teacher, principal, he did cook, everything. PE teacher, everything. Everything. We had all the subjects, and we had grades one through eight. And uh, sometimes we would be clustered to uh, for certain classes. He uh, was a strict disciplinarian. Uh, and he was loved by the community. In the summer months, they would grow gardens and prepare food for us to eat during the school year. Mm. I began school there in 1946 as a first grader, and uh, my father had an old car that he would drive about five or six miles to the school every day out of Gallatin because he had to have at least 20 plus students to keep the school open. Mm -hmm. And the community was so small, there was only eight or 10 students to fulfill that. So he had to bring them from Gallatin. So we would load up in his car, front seat and back seat, sitting on each other. And uh, every morning he would get to school about 7.30, and we started class strictly at 8 o'clock with a uh, morning devotion mm -hmm. where he had scripture and prayer every morning because he liked singing, so he would always do a little singing or have us do a little singing. And uh, we would get the day started. The cook would come in, and uh, the lady would begin cooking, and uh, we would have lunch about 1130. There was a recess that we would take once a day where— the whole school would go out, all classes would go out at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we had to kind of organize our own activities for recess. But he was a, he was real strict about the academics, especially the English and the mathematics. Mm -hmm. now, now, Charles, I understand your father, as we know, was high on education, but he, he told you something about the importance of education, what would he tell you and your siblings about that? Always go to school, go to school. I never, uh, I had experience with him. Uh, one day we was going to the store, and there's a factory. We lived on Blythe Street there in Gallatin, and some guys was up on a rooftop. It's about ninety degrees up there, a hundred or so. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him, I said, uh, "Ooh, we, I never want to go up there, boy. I bet it's hot up there." And he said, uh, son, that's where you're going to be. And I didn't get it. He said, if you don't go to school, mm. get some learning, get some education, that's where you're going to be. So I decided then I, I didn't want to be up there. Yeah. So <laughs> I listened from now on. He got the work done. Yes, he did. Okay, so what was a typical day in school like for you? Well, at the Rosenwald School was similar to any other school that were in session. The only difference, we had to walk to school. We didn't have transportation. We couldn't ride a bus. Mm -hmm. uh, we was in the city and had to drive about approximately five miles to school. And uh, when we got there, we had to uh, open up and uh, 
we started class in, in, with, uh, you know, with devotion. But uh, what was your favorite topic? What was your favorite subject? <laughs> I don't know if I had a favorite subject or not. I had to listen to all the other classes. I should be uh, smart as yeah, there, but uh, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shit. <laughs> but uh, we had to pay attention and listen and so forth. But uh, one of the things that I, I, I remember closely, I, I heard Frank say something about the, the, the meals. We had water. We had to take water from the wells and deliver our milk, order milk before we go to school. Mm. And during that time, uh, in the early 50s, Tennessee didn't have but two numbers to call in Sumner County, and it was 72. 72 was the name of a milk company, Christian Hill Milk Service. And my father would always have me to call. We'd pick up the milk and take it to school. Okay. And i just say, 24 half pints for K-Real School. And they have it in a box out there, you know, waiting on us to oh. take it with us. All right. We have to go to a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation and learn more about the impact of the Rosenwald schools. Have you heard of the Rosenwald schools? Do you know anyone who attended one? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We're starting this hour... Uh, we're talking this hour about the legacy of the Rosenwald schools, a joint venture between businessman Julius Rosenwald and educator Booker T. Washington in the early 1900s, which created nearly 5,000 schools for young black children in the South. My guests are author and photographer Andrew Filer and two former students of the Rosenwald School in Cairo, Tennessee, brothers Frank and Charles Brinkley. Andrew, Frank, and Charles, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. So, Glad to be here. Now, before the break, we got a picture of life at the Rosenwald School in Cairo, Tennessee. Andrew, what was it like photographing these buildings as you went across the South? I, I knew this was an extraordinary story. At the outset, it was not clear how you tell the story visually, and I started out shooting exterior images, one teacher schools, two teacher schools, three teacher schools, these small white clabbered structures. Uh, and at, by the end of the program, they're building one, two and three story red brick buildings. But what of the original 4,978 schools, only 500 survive and only half of those have been restored. And when I found that fact out, I realized that the historic preservation imperative was a huge part of the story. And in order to tell that story, I had to get inside. And in order to do that, I needed permission. And just to, to bring that back to our other guests here today, the way I found Frank and Charles Brinkley was I went online and I was doing, a, I did a lot of research online to find these surviving 500 schools. And there was a photograph of the Cairo school while it was under renovation and out front was one of those big signs that has the name of everybody involved in the project and it had the name of the architect. And I called the architect and told them that I'd like to come and get permission to shoot inside of the Cairo school. And they said, you need to talk to Frank and Charles Brinkley. Mm -hmm. And that is how I ended up. And so I bring this story of these former students, former teachers, preservationists, I bring their stories into this broader telling of the Rosenwald School's narrative with portraits. Now, can you tell us what the state of education was like for black children during the early 1900s? So the uh, during right after the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau creates a series of one of the imperatives coming out of the Civil War to bring African Americans into the promise of America. The imperative is education, and there are these extraordinarily moving stories of people of of emancipated. Uh, enslaved individuals walking for hours to get to these schools, young and old. And the historically black colleges begin in this era predominantly to create teachers for the African-American community. 
with with the demise of Reconstruction, with the rise of Jim Crow, that system is choked off. And so many, 90% of African Americans live in the South at the moment that Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington meet in 1911. And many of these jurisdictions do not even have public schools, and those that survive are shacks. And this program becomes transform. It is, it, it is a transformative moment in America because from 1912 to 1937, they built 4,978 schools across 15 states, mm -hmm. and they create these educational opportunities for the very, very first time for the African-American community. You know, the, the Supreme Court ruling on Plessy versus Ferguson, that case in 1896, had established this doctrine of separate but equal, which was used um, quite a bit during Jim Crow. And it was lawful, lawful for white Americans and black Americans to have these separate institutions like education as long as they were equally funded. But we know that that equally f equal funding didn't happen. How did the Rosenwald schools close that educational gap for young black students? So there, there is genius in the design of the program that Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington create together. They reach out to the black communities of the South. And they say, we want you to be a full partner in your progress. So if you will contribute to a school and we will count as your contribution, cash, land, material, or labor. And if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, and because we wanna be deliberate in creating black white dialogue as a vector for future progress. And these have to be public schools. While we welcome the school system's contribution, at a minimum, the school system has to agree to own, maintain, and staff the school, pay for the teachers. You do those two things, then Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution towards school construction. Now think about this, the black community has to participate. This is one of the earliest examples of challenge grants in philanthropic history. And the white school system has to participate. This is an early example of public-private partnership. And so, and if you jump forward, 1932, Julius Rosenwald dies. He is eulogized by the likes of W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson and Elaine Locke, who's the intellectual force behind the Harlem Renaissance, talks about how Julius Rosenwald, by enabling the black community to become a partner in their progress, put heart and soul into philanthropy. Mm. Now, you know, Frank and Charles, I understand you both have become educators. You, you, know, you chose that for yourselves as career paths. I'd like to hear from both of you on why that you made that decision. Charles, why did you decide to become an educator? Had little or no choice just about to go to school. You know, my father said I was going to school. I wanted to go to the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. I, I, I scored very high on the Air Force, but uh, he wanted me to go to college because one of his friends— who lived in Gallatin, from Gallatin, became the president. He built a college in 1950, I believe. And uh, he had promised uh, that man, Dr. J.H. White, that his kids would go to his school if he built a school. So that materialized. I mean, it actually worked out. And uh, it was six of us, and we all attended. And... Uh, he told me that uh, that's where I was going. That's where he's going to send me. Okay. But that was up to me to, you know, to make my mind up to, to stay. But you going to school. You know? No, no so, choice. Frank, no, I had no choice. Frank, same thing for you. You had no choice. You had to go to the that's, school that your father that's, told you. That's about right. That's about right. <laughs> well, well, tell me, how did, how did attending the school in Cairo, how did that influence your approach to education? Well, let me share this one story. When I was in the sixth grade, we were going home one day, traveling in the car on the way back to Gallatin. And I asked my father, I said, let me teach the second grade math tomorrow. I said, uh, I knew all that stuff you all were doing. He said, well, there's more to it than just knowing it. I said, let me try it. So he didn't say a thing. About a week later, he got us all together and he said, uh, come on up front. This is your class today. Mm -hmm. And man, I was excited. I was excited. It was one of the most exciting days at the school during my whole 12 years in, in school. And I enjoyed it so much. I asked, can I do it again? Can I do it again? 
And after a while, I was teaching the seventh graders, too. Oh, hey. And I was just in the eighth grade. Okay. But I love mathematics. And uh, he uh, he turned me loose, and I decided, he said, you know, you're going to be a great teacher one of these days. I said, I think I'm going to go into research. He said, you're going to be a great teacher one of these days. Mm-hmm. So he left it like that. <laughs> but uh, he was right. And the first day that I taught school, I called him and told him I just finished my first day in the classroom. He said, well, congratulations. Get ready for retirement because it'll be here before you know it. And I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah. I'd do it all over again if I had to. How? Okay, so talk to me about that experience being in this school that was so focused around community. How did that influence your approach to education when you became the teacher and the leader of these classrooms? You know, I heard you mention something earlier. You alluded to the fact that once a person learns how they understand how they learn, Mm -hmm. they can learn anything. I kind of I kind of focused on that because I had a lot of kids during my uh, teaching experience that learn a lot of different ways, and I would always focus on that and try to make sure that they understood. After I taught about seven years, I began what was called a seventh period class. We only had six classes a day, but I have a seventh period class where any student who had been in my class that day could come back at 3.15 to my classroom and talk about anything that we talked about in class that day. Mm -hmm. And we'd go over the same things. So I'd always get one of the maybe sharper kids to help those that were a little slow. And they enjoyed it. And and, and it became something that I really felt that that we could focus on that was really helpful, not only to me, but for the students themselves, mm-hmm. both learner and teacher. Yeah. And uh, so I've always had a tendency to feel like everybody can learn. It's just a matter of figuring out how it has to be done. So I've always been influenced by a lot of activities that went on at the Rosenwald School. Let me say this before our time is up. I also attended Tuskegee Institute. Okay. And the National Science Foundation, an academic year institute program. And uh, we saw everything George Washington Carver did. I mean, they, they they have it there where you didn't have a choice. You had to go in orientation classes. And I enjoyed that, and I saw what he had done. And I think that everybody, if they would only give back a little bit, if you put all that together, you really got a foundation for other kids to, to grow from. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, Charles, a lot of those schools and buildings, they're being used as community centers today. How do you? How does that make you feel about the Rosenwald School's legacy? It makes me feel like we're still alive. Um, it was uh, sort of different. Uh, attended during segregation, while we had to attend Rosenwald School, mm-hmm. and uh, now it uh, being kept alive in Sumner County. There was only seven Rosenwald schools, and Cairo. I think right now is the only one still exists. Uh, it's building up. It's been restored, renovated, and uh, we have community clubs uh, that's uh, uh, acting, working out of that right now. And uh, it, it, it makes us feel good because it's still we're still working with it. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. still relevant. It's still a hard, it, the center it, of the community. It is. In so it many really, ways. It really is. That's really fantastic. Now, you know, Andrew... Talk to me about, you know, the legacy of these schools and what you want our listeners to walk away with. The the Rosenwald Schools program is, in fact, one of the most transformative developments in the first half of the 20th century in America. And yet it remains hidden history and its scope and sweep is largely unknown. This program, there, there are two economists in the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald Schools and what their data shows is that prior to World War I, there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South. That gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it is an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement to come, come through these schools. Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrate Little Rock Central High, and Congressman John Lewis, who wrote this exquisite introduction to my book, all went to Rosenwald schools. And I think the other thing that I would say is this. 
we live in this time of a divided America and Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington in 1912 America, the deep Jim Crow America are reaching across divides of race, religion and region and they transform this country for the better. And I think that there's a important message today to all of those who are on the front lines of driving for social change and progress in America, that individual actions matter and we can change the world. That is author and photographer Andrew Feiler. He is the author of the exhibit um, A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 Schools That Changed America. It's up now at the Tennessee State Museum. He was joined by retired educator Charles Brinkley and his brother, who's also a retired educator, Frank Brinkley. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all so much Our for pleasure. being with us today. Thanks again for having us. I really do appreciate this. This Our is pleasure. great. We have to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll learn more about the legacy of the Rosewood schools here in Tennessee. And you can always join the conversation and tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been talking this hour about the Rosenwald schools and their role in educating thousands of black students across the South during Jim Crow segregation. Now, let's learn about the legacy of these schools here in our state and what's being done to honor and commemorate them. For that, I'd like to bring on my next guests. Delisa Harris is the Director of Library Services at Fisk University's John Hope and Aurelia E. Franklin Library, home of the Julius Rosenwald Archive. She is joined by Matthew Gilani, the lead curator of the exhibit Building a Bright Future, Black Communities and Rosenwald Schools in Tennessee, which will open on June 16th at the Tennessee State Museum. Delisa, Matthew, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank this you. is Nashville. Thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Really yeah. great to have you both. So, you know, Delisa, Fisk is home of the Julius Rosenwald Archive. Yes. I imagine you have a lot of important documents <laughs> that, you know, relate to the founding of the operation of the Rosenwald schools. I'd love to hear more about yes. what it contains. Yes. Our archive um, is a comprehensive archive of the fund's entire existence. So um, there's a large section on the rural school program, which was run out of Nashville um, for most of the fund's existence. Um, and in our archives, we house um, a collection of index cards um, that list all of the schools in each of the 15 south, southern, southeastern states um, and their counties, along with images. Uh, That's really awesome. Yeah. And tell me, what were... You know, because you're you're looking through these archives, you can yes. tell a lot about a person. Yes. <laughs> what were you able to learn about Julius Rosenwald as you've gone through the archives? Yeah, I learned that um, he really was a good man, a good person, um, and he was dedicated to the cause of educating um, African American students in the South and ensuring that there was an opportunity for these students to to learn and to to grow and and to have support. Did the archives tell you anything about his relationship with Booker T. Washington? Yes. Yeah, so um, not as much as you would think in our archives, um, but there is um, the focus of the work that started out at Tuskegee. So initially, um, Rosenwald provided financial support to an operation that Booker T. Washington was running at Tuskegee with his architects, his builders, and um, staff. And so through that relationship and partnership, um, Julius Rosenwald, you know, clung on to Washington's vision and and just built something even more massive. Talk to me about why that's important. I mean, Rosenwald provided the money. Right. But Washington provided the vision. The vision. Yes. And the vision is important because um, as and during this time, you know, a lot of white Philanthropists um, 
maybe didn't have that vision, that insight into what is happening in these rural communities for black families? What are the needs? Why does this matter? And Booker T. Washington, through his own firsthand experience Mm. as a black man in the South, understood the needs and the importance of education. Now, Matthew, we know that there were 354 Rosenwald schools across our state. How many of the buildings that house the schools, how many of them are still standing? So that's an excellent question. Um, And I believe the Tennessee Department of Archaeology um, has either recently released or about to release. They've been working on a survey where they've actually gone across all three of Tennessee's grand divisions, east, middle, and west, because this program affected the whole state. And they've looked to see, um, just answers just that question. And I believe approximately of the 354 schools that were built at one point, about 60 of those structures are still standing, um, are some of the numbers that you'll hear. And of course, that means a wide variety of things. It could mean that it is a restored public-facing building that's a community center that's on the National Register for Historic Places, or it could be a building that is in more disrepair on private land. So it really is a, a broad spectrum. But I think that's so important to note and and speaks more to the work that's being done at Fisk University to preserve these resources and other organizations that this legacy is still ongoing. These buildings still exist. Alumni, their descendants is still very much a part of Tennessee's history and a part of Tennessee's present. Now, you know, in the previous segment, we had the Brinkley brothers, two former students of the Rosenwald schools. Did you have a chance to talk to any alums while you were working on the exhibit? Yes, and um, we were very privileged to be able to visit about 15, 16 different communities um, and separate schools that are still standing, once again, across all three of Tennessee's Grand Divisions. And um, we really just reached out to mostly public-facing buildings and asked if anyone wanted to speak with us. You know, we really wanted this exhibit, Building a Bright Future, to be community-focused. And that was just really a privilege to be able to talk and learn from the alumni. What story really stands out with you? I think one that really stood out to me was um, we went to Hohenwald, Tennessee, um, uh, and there, of course, was a school that was built there. Um, It's currently still standing. It's actually part of a uh, senior citizen uh, living center, so still part of the community. And we were, frank, um, lucky enough to meet with a few alumni who had decided to spend some of their time talking to us. And I think this speaks to the importance of um, the teachers, the men and women who learned in these schools, taught in these schools. Uh, They talked about the teacher, Miss Allison. And apparently, Miss Allison um, moved to Hohenwald. She taught at the ro- the uh, school that was there prior to the Rosenwald School, a one-room schoolhouse. On a train to Nashville, she met R.E. Clay, who was the Rosenwald agent for Tennessee at the time. He talked with her. She then went back to the community, led efforts to fundraise, helped construct the new school, Rosenwald School, that was built in Hohenwald in the late 1920s and continue to teach there, I think, into the 1950s or 60s. Wow. So we spoke with some of her students. And I think what stood out there was, and something that's been touched on by Delisa and, and, and the Brinkley Brothers and Mr. Filer is, you know, the, the Rosenwald funds, they provide this leverage. That's key. But in a lot of cases, if you look at the numbers, the black communities that are fighting for these schools, they're actually outraising the Rosenwald Fund in Tennessee. So the Rosenwald donations are critical. But the communities themselves, you know, that agency, that fight, when they're being double taxed already, paying for school facilities they can't use, you know, that that story of that self-determination and figures like Miss House and that teacher, I think, is what stood out the most. Well, Delisa, what does that tell you about how the community believed in this vision and idea of the Rosenwald schools? Yeah, it says a lot. And I, I love that Matthew discuss self-determination because, I mean, that is what existed during this time period and even after um, for a lot of black communities was the idea of we can create something and we can build something that will last and, and the legacy still lives on today. And those the numbers that he discussed for fundraising exist in our archives. So people across these 15 states today still research and um, are looking for information on their schools at Fisk and can see those numbers and how black communities were able to, you know, have bake sales at church, fundraise um, in other ways for their school. You know, how important is it in maintaining and sharing this legacy since, you know, right now, CRT, there's a book banning going on. Education is a highly politicized issue across the country and here in this state. How important is it for everybody to understand the legacy of these schools here in Tennessee and their impact? 
Yeah, it's important. As you stated, there's a lot going on with when it, as it pertains to African-American history. Um, and understanding this legacy, anytime you understand the past, it helps you to work your future, right? To, to look forward and to move forward and to build a brighter future. Um, and so also understanding the pride that has always existed amongst the African-American community that was inherently um, true and valued is important um, to sustaining that pride today and that and that um, support in the history and preserving archives and records. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, we only have a couple minutes left, but I know you both have projects in the works. I want to talk about those very briefly. Matthew, can you tell us more about the exhibit Building a Bright Future at the Tennessee State Museum? What can people expect? Yeah, absolutely. So that'll be coming up, as you mentioned, in June of this year. And we really see this as a great opportunity to complement Andrew Fowler's exhibit, um, which is currently on display at the State Museum. And in particular, we want this second exhibit to focus on the Tennessee community story. So, of course, there's the context of the Rosenwald Fund, this amazing story of philanthropy. But who are the men and women in these communities across the state that are fighting for these schools, not just to be constructed in the early 20th century, but their descendants and alumni who are fighting today to preserve them and keep them as part of the cultural landscape. So images, stories, we've been lucky enough to receive some objects on loan from alumni themselves to help tell that story. And, um, you know, we're just very excited, privileged to have it at the museum and hope it just uh, does everyone justice. It sounds really cool. I can expect a lot of field trips to that one. Our edu- education department is ready. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Well, Lisa, tell us about the project that Fisk is embarking on to digitize the archive. Yes. So the Millen Foundation has generously funded a four-year project um, at $1.6 million to um, digitize and make accessible the entire records of the Julius Rosenwald Fund. So Um, the large portion of the school records, which include financial information, images, and the index cards, and also um, other aspects of the fellowship. Mr. Filer mentioned Elaine Locke and other figures from the Harlem Renaissance. We have the fellowship files for those people who were funded through Julius Rosenwald to do work um, in their um, perspective fields. So we are excited Mm -hmm. and we're, you know, we're already into the project um, and wrapping up our first year of work. Digitizing takes a long time. When do you expect to be done with the entire thing? Yes, we expect to be done by 2026. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we're moving along. Yeah, (laughs) you're moving along, (laughs) taking your time, making sure you get it right. Yes, we want to get it right. And um, like Matthew and his team at the State Museum has done, we're um, talking to the community and want to incorporate their voice as much as possible in this project as well. Wonderful. This sounds so exciting. And thank you both for helping to preserve this history and bring it to all of us here in Middle Tennessee and the rest of the country. I want to thank my guests, Delisa Harris. She is the Director of Library Services at Fisk University. She was joined by Matthew Gilani, the Museum Curator at the Tennessee State Museum. Thanks again to both of you for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And we want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. Tomorrow, allergy season is here. No matter how you feel about it, we're going to talk to local experts about how to get some relief. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Our show has only been possible because of your support. We're in the midst of our spring fund drive, and we need you to help step up and to make your donation now at thisisnashville.org. And while you're there, you can listen back to all of our episodes. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tudhope. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Special thanks to Dr. Mary Hoffschwelli and Joe Pagetta. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville and find us on Instagram. Let us know what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be really good to each other. <laughs>